All right, if we are ready to uh, begin, let me uh, bang the gavel. Good afternoon, everyone. The Sacramento City Council will please come to order. Would the clerk please call the roll to establish a quorum? Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Ashby. Here. Council Member Warren. Here. Vice Mayor Harris. Here. Council Member Hansen. Council Member Hansen. Here. Council Member Chenier. Here. Council Member Guerra. Here. Council Member Jennings. Mayor Steinberg. I'm here. Um, I believe that we ha have a quorum. Um, would everyone please rise? Can't hear. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Did you call Madam Clerk, did you call me? I did. Here. Council Member Carr. Thank you. Here. And Council Member Jennings. Council Member Jennings. Can hear you. Rick is can't not. Hear, can't hear Rick. Yeah. I see Council Member Jennings. We'll record him as present, of course, but. He's Thank you. I can't hear. Help him figure out his technology. Thank you, Council Member Jennings is here. We have full council. Okay, very good. Let's all rise. I'd ask Council Member Warren to please lead the council in the pledge of, and the public in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's always an honor. I pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag. flag. The United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Very good. For all. For all. Absolutely. Um, I'd like to begin tonight with a uh, a virtual special presentation. Um, I'm going to present this to um, a representative here of uh, the Sacramento chapter of the American Heart Association, Andy Holt, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, but this resolution is not only intended for the American Heart Association, it's also intended for the Sacramento Fire Department. Uh, it is a resolution which recognizes the fire department's uh, outstanding achievement in specifically within the EMS division. For the second year in a row, our fire department has received what's known as a Mission Lifeline Performance Achievement Gold Plus Award. Now, as I read through the resolution, and I won't read it all to you, what it basically says is that we are not only adhering to, but we are exceeding the standards for life-saving emergency care when it comes to- I can't, to I can't hear him. It's not, I, I, I'm, I'm, try, I'm trying to, I'm, all right, I'm trying to resolve it, all right. What, uh, the resolution, again, is recognizing our fire department, not just meeting, but exceeding the standard for care when it comes to transporting critically ill patients with heart, heart disease who have suffered heart attacks, get to uh, a tier one facility so that their lives can be saved, life and death here. So to the fire department, to the EMS division, to uh, our rank and file of firefighters, uh, a heartfelt, no pun intended, <laughs> Congratulations, and um, and a great thank you to you for uh, being the difference uh, between life and death for so many people. And Andy, to the Heart Association for recognizing us, our fire department, but also for what you do uh, to advocate for uh, for healthier hearts and what you do and your organization does to save so many lives. We've come such a long way when it comes to heart disease in our country. And it's in no small part due to the research and the advocacy 
of the American Heart Association. So if you'll put out your hands, please. I, I virtually <laughs> this resolution, deem it accepted. I, we will mail this to you or get this to you, but please, you have the floor here and, uh, and, uh, and we welcome you. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, I don't know if I need to go through all the award information. I think you, you covered it really well, but um, I wanna uh, thank uh, you, Mayor Steinberg and the city council. I appreciate you letting me come today to this meeting. Uh, hello to everyone. Um, as mayor introduced me, my name is Andy Hote. I'm the development manager for the American Heart Association and American Stroke Association. And I work within our quality outcomes research and analytics group. So I am here today to recognize the Sacramento City Fire Department for achieving again the 2020 Mission Lifeline EMS Gold Plus Award. And I wanna emphasize again, as you alluded to um, Mayor uh, Steinberg, because it is really fantastic that says a lot about the organization. And once again, they've attained this award. Every year, more than 250,000 people experience an ST elevation myocardial infarction, or also known as a STEMI or a major heart attack. This is the deadliest type of heart attack caused by a blockage of blood flow to the heart that requires timely treatment. The American Heart Association recognizes that pre-hospital personnel are the first providers of care for the patient suffering from a heart attack and are integral part of the system of care, impacting the overall care and outcome of that patient. We certainly applaud the Sacramento City Fire Department for achieving the award again for implementing quality measures for the treatment of patients who experience severe heart attacks. Some of these key measures include their efforts in improving, and excuse me, their efforts in, in improving systems of care to rapidly identify suspected heart attack patients, promptly notify the medical center and trigger an early response from awaiting hospital personnel among multiple additional metrics that are measured. So on behalf of the American Heart Association, the American Stroke Association, congratulations to the Sacramento City Fire Department for achieving the Mission Lifeline EMS Recognition Gold Plus Award. So virtual applause all around, and I'll hand it back to you. Okay, um, thank you again for, it's really important that we acknowledge uh, when we are leaders uh, and uh, on behalf of the city council, um, gratitude to our fire department for a job well done. Uh, anybody else, Angelique? <laughs> sure, Mayor Chad Augustine, our deputy chief, is on there too. I think he'd like to say something. Okay, I, I did not see you, Chad. I'm sorry. Welcome. Good evening, good evening, yeah, Mayor and Council. Have the real chief, and the real chief's on too. <laughs> Hey, on, on behalf of the hardworking men and women of the Sacramento Fire Department, I am excited to accept this this uh, award. Um, as was noted, this is the fourth year in a row we've achieved uh, American Heart Association Award and the second year that we've achieved the highest award possible. And, and while really it's an honor to um, be recognized, it's ultimately the residents of Sacramento that benefit most from this award. Our ability to recognize these critical life-threatening emergencies, provide timely and effective care and rapid transport to the right facility really makes a difference between life and death for our residents. And the end result is a better quality of life. And none of that would be uh, possible without your support. So I really wanna take this opportunity to thank uh, the council for your continued support of the Sacramento Fire Department. And what's that look like? It's the support that you provide us in funding for our cardiac monitors, our technology, our training, additional ambulances, all of that um, funding is what allows us to provide this excellent care. And the investment that you're making in the Sacramento Fire Department truly is making a difference for our residents. So thank you. Thank you, Deputy Chief, appreciate it. Um, Chief Loge, anything you wanna add? Uh, just same thing, I just wanna thank everybody. Uh, Chad said it all. Uh, Chad is responsible, oversees the EMS department for me. Andy, I wanna thank you again for joining with us on this. And uh, I'm just really proud of the department and also thank you all for your support. It means a lot to all of us. Excellent, okay. Um, Mayor, I just wanna tell him congratulations and uh, really proud of him. And Chad, is this the exact award you promised us this time last year? Because 
I distinctly remember you promising us last year you would bring us an award. Is this the one, Andy? Did he do it? Yes, he did it. So okay. All right, promise good. fulfilled. <laughs> all right. Okay, we'll keep him. All right. Thank you. Congratulations. And thanks Thank you. to all the hard work to our firefighters in the city of Sacramento. We're really proud. Great. Great work. Good. Um, Vice Mayor Harris had a comment. Uh, I'm not sure if on this or another item. Well, first off, I'd just like to congratulate the fire department as well. And Chad is not only a great medic, but he's a great pilot as well. Really love that man. Anyway, uh, what I wanted to say was a welcome to some of the students of Richard Lonnie's Government One class. I had the wonderful opportunity to address them last night. And I see a couple of the students that I recognize from our talk last night here to observe the council and to understand how our city governments work. So I wanted to extend my warm welcome to uh, the students from Richard Lonnie's class. Thank you, Mayor. Very good, thank you. Welcome to the students. Um, interested in your feedback as you watch the public process in action here. Members, we have a consent calendar. Are there any items that members uh, would like to remove from the consent calendar? Mayor? Move the consent calendar. Mayor? Yes, sir. Uh, this is Council Member Jennings, and um, I would like to recuse myself from item number 24 and item number 23. The Greater Sacramento Urban League is a source of income to myself, my wife, and my family. And uh, with that, in an abundance of caution, I would like to recuse myself from item number 23 and item number 24. Very good. Uh, that that shall be uh, fully noted in the record, Councilmember Jennings. Um, and Mr. Mayor, Mayor for, the record, for the record, item number 26 is withdrawn completely. 26 is withdrawn completely. Okay. okay. And I have three public callers. Let's hear the public callers. Although, Councilmember Hanson, do you want to wait or do you want to go first? Uh, I, it's just a really quick comment um, on item number 16, which has to do with the um, North 16th Street streetscape. Sorry, not 16. Um, I just was scrolling. Uh, on the North, North 16th Streetscape item, um, and I will find that again. Uh, we had asked staff to work on um, planning to replace uh, the uh, Union Pacific Railroad Bridge there that separates the central city from the river district. And this plan doesn't have that in there, but um, I'm happy to support this plan going forward. But I would like to include as direction that the number 13, not 16, 13 for 16th Street um, that they continue to work on um, assessing that bridge for replacement. It's substandard, it's dangerous, and it does further constrain the ability of people to walk and bike to get from downtown north to places like Marisol Village and other other stops. So um, with that, I'll second um, Council Member Guerra. Uh, Mayor, if I can just add on to that, yeah. Steve is completely right that that bridge is actually um, at the end of its useful life. And if we are able to find a way to replace it, it will open up the River District and make uh, the 16th Street project actually truly functional. It's a restriction right now. And, you know, as built, it's unsafe. It's, uh, it's actually difficult for people to get to the River District. This is a critical piece of the 16th Street plan. And I'd also like to thank all of our public works staff for a tremendous effort on re-envisioning 16th Street. If we can get there on this project, it will make a very big difference to the River District. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. Um, all right, let us, uh, we have a motion and a second on the consent calendar. Council Member Jennings will uh, be uh, not voting as, the, uh, as he casts presumably otherwise cast a yes vote on the consent calendar, but will not be voting on items 24 and item 25. 23. Excuse me, 23 and 24, I apologize. 23 and 24. All right, let us call the roll. Do you wanna hear from the callers first, Mr. Mayor? Oh yeah, sorry, go Thank ahead. You. May I have my first caller, please?
Welcome to the meeting. You have two minutes to address the council. Thank you. I'm calling from District 6. On behalf of the Heritage Raritan community, I ask that we be granted an easement for the maintenance and protection of the railroad tracks in the uh, railroad corridor. That This is talking about item 14 for the Del Rio Trail. The current bike trail plan is deliberately and premeditatedly designed to permanently wreck a Heritage Railroad. A more equitable design that respects the citywide and statewide Heritage Railroad and community and not just a handful of politically well-connected members of a privileged class should be considered. I yield the remainder of my time. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next caller, please. Next caller, please. Welcome to the meeting. You have two minutes to address the council. Yes. Um, this is consent uh, item 25 um, on the Great Plains uh, delivery service. I really depend on having the, that delivered, and you should not exclude the current drivers from this um, meeting. What does that mean, ma'am? Pardon me? Well, I, I want you to explain what you mean, because I, I, we want to make sure that we... Uh, that we're yeah. I depend on the uh, on having that uh, service delivered to me, okay? And my current driver is wonderful, okay? And I don't want him excluded from uh, from driving. Has he been Has he been excluded? No, not yet. He's about to be, I guess. Well. If you we could get your if we could get your number to my staff person, uh, Madam Clerk Julia Burroughs, we will follow up with you to make sure that your service is not disrupted in any way. All right, let's let's follow up on that, please. Okay. okay we we will. I don't know the status of the driver, but we will make sure that your service is not disrupted in any way. Okay, fine. Oh, you, you want my phone number, right? If you could leave it with the city clerk, yes. Have, Madam Clerk, how do we get the call? Ma'am, ma I have her phone number. Ma'am, okay. I have your phone numbers. Okay, we'll make sure that we'll, we will call you uh, tonight or tomorrow morning, okay? Okay, I, re I really appreciate your uh, service. Thank you very much. We appreciate you. Thank you for calling in. Okay. So next. next caller, please. Mr. Mayor, I have no more callers on the consent calendar. Okay. Thank you all very much. So again, we've got a motion on the consent calendar in a second. Call the vote with, uh, uh, with the uh, council member Jennings. Uh, exception as uh, I described earlier for the record. Please call the roll. Thank you for 23 and 24. Council member Jennings is recused and item 26 is withdrawn. So Mayor Pro Tem Ashby. Yes. Council member Warren. Yes. Vice Mayor Harris. Aye. Council Member Hansen. Aye. Council Member Chenier. Aye. Council Member Guetta. Aye. Council Member Jennings. Aye. Council Member Carr. Aye. And Mayor Steinberg. Aye. All right, members, we do have one public hearing and two discussion items. Let's move right to the public hearing item 27 regarding business operating uh, permit fees for cannabis nurseries. Who is presenting on this? Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. This is Davina Smith. I am the Cannabis Program Manager for the City of Sacramento. Uh, this item is to establish a discrete fee for cannabis nurseries um, to facilitate that permit fee tracking. Uh, the fees for this permit type will stay the same. They are currently at $9,700 for a first fee and then for a renewal it's um, so that concludes my presentation, but I'm happy to answer any questions you may have about uh, this matter. Is there public testimony on this item? Yes, Mr. Mayor, I have four callers. Okay, let's hear from the four callers, please. Thank you. First caller, please. Thank you. 
May we have the first caller, please? The colors in the process of being transferred. Just one moment, please. Hi, do we have some technology issues? It appears we're having technical difficulties. I do have a fort. Here we go. Welcome to the meeting. You have two minutes to address the council. Caller, are you there? Yes. Uh, good evening, honorable uh, council members, mayor, and staff. Caller, can you speak up, please? We can barely hear you. Caller, you need to speak up. We can barely hear you. Hello. Caller, please make your comments. Sorry about that. Uh, good evening, honorable council members, mayor, and staff. Thank you for the opportunity to give public comment uh, this evening on item 29. My name is Fong Bui and I'm the Government Partnerships Manager for SPIN, one of the shared rideable operators in the city and the exclusive shared rideable operator. This for is the wrong system. item, Mindy. Uh, this is 27. Correct. Caller, you're calling in on item 27. You'll need to hang up, call back. When you call back into the queue, you'll dial four to make comments on number time 29. Thank you. Next caller, please. Welcome to the meeting. You have two minutes to address the council. I'm calling, my name is Dorothy Gibson and I live in the city of Sacramento and I'm calling concerning consent calendar item 25. Great Plates delivered contact tracks should not exclude current drivers. This is very important, and I appreciate you listening to me. If you have a concern, ma'am, we just passed this item, but it's okay. Um, we're all uh, flexible here with the with the technology. We, we're very happy to hear from you. I'd like I, I'll ask my staff again to call you to make sure that there's no disruption in your service. Okay, I, I, I'm not, we're, we're we know there the issue you're speaking of, but the main thing is, is that you have no anxiety about um, getting uh, the food that you need. So let's get that number again to my, my team, right? So Mr. Mayor, I have that phone number and I will forward that to Julia Burroughs on your staff to call her back. Thank you so much. All right, any, any, any other calls on uh, this or any other item? I have no more calls on this item. Okay, so uh, let's now hear from the city council. Um, any members want to speak on this item? Okay. I'll move the item, Mayor. Okay. Second. A cannabis item that's taken less than 10 minutes. This is a... Mindy, do we need to open and close the public hearing? Yes, we do. Oh, I will Thank open you. and close the public hearing and move the item. Second. Moved and seconded. Let's call the roll, please. So the item was mo moved by Councilmember Chenier and a second by Councilmember Guetta. Mayor Pro Tem Ashby? Yes. Councilmember Warren? Yes. Vice Mayor Harris? Aye. Councilmember Hansen? Aye, aye. Councilmember Chenier? Aye. Councilmember Guetta? Aye. Councilmember Jennings? Aye. Councilmember Carr? Yes. And Mayor Steinberg? 
Hi. Thank you very much. Now let us move to the discussion calendar and item 28 and invite our city auditor, uh, Jorge Oseguera, uh, to report on the uh, community survey that the council asked for as part of our COVID-19 response and the distribution of our CARES resources. Mr. Thank city you. Auditor. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor. Good evening, Mayor and members of the city council. Jorge Oseguera, your city auditor. The recommendation that is before you is that you pass a motion by two thirds vote to temporarily suspend council rules, to bypass budget and audit, and to two, receive and file the city auditor's COVID-19 business and resident survey. Okay. Do we have to do that, bypass do first? Do that first? Excuse me? Do we have to do that first or? I'm not sure. Before we hear it, do we need to waive a rule before we actually hear the item, Madam Clerk? You don't, you can hear the item okay. and then your motion at the end will include that. Then uh, dive right in. Great. Just pull up the screen here for the presentation. Everybody see my screen? Sounds like it. So, yes, we can. Um, Back in June um, 2nd and 4th, we did our first survey of our residents and our businesses regarding COVID-19 impacts. That survey served to inform the council on how the city may spend uh, the over $89 million in coronavirus relief funds that it received. Um, since then, we did a follow-up uh, survey this time we decided to approach it uh, differently by making it available to all uh, city residents and to all businesses in the city. Um, by doing this, we were able to get over 1,200 residents to complete the survey, as well as the participation of over 120 of our local businesses. The results of the survey are uh, quite lengthy, but I'll try to be brief in covering some of the highlights that were shown by uh, the results of our survey. As you can see on this first slide, uh, one of the questions that we asked about was whether the residents were comfortable with um, the government requirement of wearing masks in public. Uh, based on the response to this survey, that <coughs> answer was 93% answered in the affirmative that they were comfortable with the government's requirement. That is actually um, somewhat higher from when we first pulled it back in June. Uh, at that time, it pulled at about 82% support for um, the government requiring mask wearing. On this slide, we highlight some of the problems that are faced by some of our residents and um, we have listed them from uh, the higher rated problems down to the lower rated problems. As you can see by this slide, the one that rated the highest is not knowing when the pandemic, pandemic will end with 71% of respondents indicating that it is either extremely serious or very serious of a problem, followed by feeling nervous, anxious, or on edge, not feeling in control, feeling alone, isolated, or not being able to socialize with other people, reduction in employment and income, and helping uh, children with online schooling. Um, the list continues with these being uh, less of a problem, but still uh, somewhat notable. And so included in these are issues such as not being able to exercise, access to medical services, and shortage of sanitation and cleaning supplies. In regards to the uh, respondents' feelings regarding the uh, approval or disapproval of the job of the different levels of government, the results were interesting. 
Uh, in regards to the federal government, uh, based on the responses, almost 80% strongly disapprove with how uh, the federal government is handling the pandemic. And that is in um, stark contrast to how the residents feel about the city of Sacramento, where over 58% um, of the residents feel that we are doing a good job or somewhat approve of the work of uh, our city. Uh, and that is in line with also how the residents responded to the job that the state government is doing as well. I think that was 68 rather than 58, if I heard correct. Oh, excuse me. Right. We need that 10%, so. <laughs> Um, and then uh, looking a little bit more specifically into the city of Sacramento, uh, we also uh, inquired about a couple of specific areas uh, regarding the satisfaction of our residents and the services that we're providing. That's uh, informing residents about issues facing the community, being open and transparent to the public, generally acting in the best interest of the community and overall confidence in the city of Sacramento. And as you can see, um, it is um, right around 55% uh, uh, for most of those categories. In this graphic, um, I know there's a lot of information on here, but it uh, provides some important information. Uh, this graphic leads uh, shows in terms of level of importance, um, several types of assistance that would be desirable to the city of Sacramento. And again, they're listed in uh, order of importance with the one rating the highest being access to timely and accurate communications about COVID-19, followed by support for small businesses, enforcement of shelter in home orders and physical distancing, uninterrupted police, fire and medical emergency response services, mental health services, assistance making residents uh, rent and mortgage payments, access to a quality internet connection, assistance navigating and applying for various COVID-19 related assistance programs, financial assistance to purchase food and assistance escaping an abusive environment. Um, something of note, at least for me personally, in seeing the results of this information and that um, I would like to note at this time is that the council, uh, in my opinion, has made a very strong effort to provide uh, a broad range of services and investments in our community to try to mitigate the negative impacts of COVID-19. And as you can see reflected here, you know, there's a wide range of issues. And fortunately, the council invested in a wide range of programs to cover many of these issues that are listed here. And um, I would just like to note that um, that effort, in my opinion, should be applauded um, other communities haven't approached it this way. I know that that is a harder lift for a government to try to cover such broad areas of concern, but I think uh, it more likely than not will help the overall community recover uh, more quickly. Just some uh, information regarding where some of our responses came from. Uh, this is the distribution by council district. Uh, we did try to reach out using uh, various different methods to the community to try to increase participation. Um, as the council well knows, some of our council districts are a little bit harder to encourage participation than others. Um, we have the information related to who participated and we hope to continue to grow the number of participants with these types of surveys in the future. Some of the key findings overall, just to kind of summarize, are that the coronavirus pandemic has been very disruptive to most residents. While the financial impacts are severe to some households, many residents are struggling with mental and emotional health during the pandemic. For many families, making arrangements for children is a serious problem. While many residents and households are struggling, many also are taking action to help the community during this difficult time. And many feel it's important for the city of Sacramento to provide assistance to the community and household. That concludes the resident portion. I can either go into the business survey next or answer questions that you may have regarding the resident survey. Why, why don't you go through the whole presentation and then we'll open it up to the public and the council to ask about any aspect of the 
of the comprehensive survey. Perfect. So with the business survey, we did get 127 responses uh, as shown on this slide. Um, has some interesting information in there. As you can see uh, on this pie chart, uh, our businesses have been significantly impacted uh, with those responding indicating that um, reduced business hours has been experienced by uh, 32%. Completely shutting down during the pandemic has been experienced by 37% of the businesses. 4% of our businesses have permanently shut down uh, with no intent to reopen. Um, very few businesses have had to uh, expand their business hours due to the pandemic, at only 2%. Um, when asked about how quickly they believe that they would be able to return to no normal once things uh, calm down regarding the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, many of them indicated that it would take a significant amount of time, one year or more, was indicated by 37% of the respondents. In regards to reduction in sales due to the emergence uh, of COVID-19, uh, more than 50% reduction in sales was indicated by 61% of the respondents. Uh, when asked, uh, how do you think the actual 2020 revenue for the entire year will compare to your original budgeted projections, 82% uh, indicated that there would be a serious shortage of more than 25% reduction in their 2020 revenue. This is similar in style to what we saw with the um, resident survey. This is a listing in terms of uh, more serious problems to list least serious problems uh, faced by our businesses. Uh, the one receiving the highest rating was decline in business or sales at 84%, indicating it's a very serious problem or an extremely serious problem. Businesses closed or hours reduced by government follows, then difficulty paying commercial rent or commercial mortgage or lines of credit. The emotional health of employees, the ability of employees to pay rent or mortgage on reduced income, concerns about liability, of our employees being exposed to COVID-19, not having funds to cover COBRA and or insurance expenditures for their employees, concerns about the well-being of employees being exposed to COVID-19 on the job, lack of events to promote the downtown or business area, and not having funds to pay employees makes up the top 10 uh, problems being faced by our businesses. When looking at methods business are businesses are using to mitigate COVID-19 impacts. Um, these businesses are either already doing or considering doing uh, several of these things like trying to identify state and national funding sources or assisting employees with transitional resources such as unemployment benefits, moving to more online businesses and engaging more with social media to promote businesses. In terms of the importance of various types of assistance to businesses, the top three that were reported as either being very important or extremely important were funding to assist with commercial rent or mortgage payments, funding to assist with normal operating expenses, including payroll, and assistance navigating and applying for various COVID-19 related assistance programs. So to summarize uh, some of the key findings, many Sacramento businesses do not feel prepared for the changes to the economy as a result of the pandemic and ex uh, express uncertainty regarding their future operations. The impacts of COVID-19 on business communities have been immense. Sacramento businesses need short-term capital and the decline in business revenue has and will continue to impact Sacramento's workforce. That concludes my presentation and I am available to answer any questions should you have any. Okay, um, really what an ambitious um, uh, work, piece of work here and uh, really, really important. And, and, you know, gratifying, if you will, that the council's instinct and the community's instinct about how we should spend this CARES money really lines up <laughs> very well with uh, what the public has said in the community survey. And that's, 
that's very gratifying. Um, I agree. Yeah. So what um, are, is there public testimony, Madam Clerk? Yes, I have one caller on this item. Okay. May we have our first caller, please? Welcome to the meeting. You have two minutes to address the council. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. This is Mike Barnbaum and I'm in District 2. Uh, I wanted to talk about the COVID-19 community survey uh, and its impact on residents. Uh, the presenter mentioned uh, one of the topics was uh, assistance with escaping an abusive environment. And one thing I did not hear that was mentioned uh, was assistance escaping a restrictive environment, much more restrictive than uh, pre-pandemic. Uh, and Mayor, I wanna thank you and council member Harris and council member Ashby uh, and council member elect Valenzuela uh, for I think the first time in over six months uh, we had something uh, uh, that we were able to do in person on Saturday, albeit outdoors. And uh, we talked for quite a bit, among other topics, about uh, COVID and how it's impacting Sacramento. Um, I think part of the restrictive environment, I would like to see uh, open public meetings again, as long as the restrictive restriction of or requirement of mask wearing is agreed upon by everyone in a chamber if that was to happen again. And I think it's going to require uh, the city of Sacramento and probably cities across our great state to meet with the governor and his staff to loosen a little bit of his executive order currently making public meetings closed to the public. Uh, and, and I wanted to put this into the record uh, and see if the, our city, much like the city of Los Angeles, might be willing to also have weekly updates by the mayor about COVID and how we can go. Thank you for your comments. Your time is complete. Will you make your final comment, please? Yes, I'm concluding with a comment that I hope we can have a weekly address about how we could better our color system. Thank you for your comments. Our environment soon. Thank, Thank you for you. your comments. I have no more callers, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Um, are there? Uh, I know that uh, Vice Mayor Harris uh, was up to speak on this. Thank you, Mayor. First, Jorge, I'd like to thank you and your team for an exhaustive report that gives us a lot of really valuable information for decision making moving forward. Uh, looking at the business aspect of it, you know, it, it, uh, it's pretty dire news, quite frankly, that 40% of our businesses are under such stress that many may not reopen, uh, that many people have been laid off. You know, I think that We've had a couple of distractions lately, major distractions, like the calamity of the California wildfires. And then of course, there's the federal administration, which is moving in a direction that is counter to what our scientists are saying that we should do. Um, as we move into fall, you know, the admonitions from the scientists are saying, we need to be very careful about this virus and we need to stay the course. We need to keep isolating. We need to keep wearing masks. At the same time, we're very social creatures and everybody has COVID pandemic fatigue and they want to socialize and they want to get out. They want normalcy to their life again. And your, your survey shows that in brilliant detail. We are gonna have a bit of a struggle with our small businesses moving forward. You know, they are a significant amount of our tax base and certainly comprise our largest collectively, our largest employer in the city of Sacramento. I think we all know in our districts that restaurants have closed and may not be able to reopen. And that can affect an awful lot of what happens in the city of Sacramento. 
So I thank you for this. It was really an eye-opener to read your report. I think for me, for me, one of the most significant pieces of work that your office has produced and one of the most useful for us for decision-making moving forward. Especially in the community report, uh, you know, it was on page 189, if in, anyone is interested about the, the social aspects of the COVID pandemic and the toll it's taking on people personally. I know that many people will relate to this, but I have a 15 year old daughter and you know, she's in a very formative time of her life and the lack of ability to socialize, to learn to drive, to go on dates, to go to the movies is taking a huge toll on her. Although she's handling it quite well and with a stiff upper lip, I see that she's losing a year of her social development through this pandemic and that is something that we all need to be very aware of. You know, I expect that myself and my colleagues feel it too. I know I'm pretty darn sick of Zoom and team meetings and I really long to be back in chambers. I really do. I, you know, I, I miss the social interaction with my colleagues and I feel that we actually conduct our business more ably when we're able to speak to each other and see each other and interact in that way. <clears throat> At the same time, the admonition is going into fall. There could be a resurgence of the virus. It's happening in parts of the country. It's happening in Europe. And, uh, you know, the idea is not to let our guard down quite yet. We still need to isolate for a while. And yet at the same time, the federal government is pressing and pressing and pressing to reopen. You know, I, I think everybody understands that. We need to make money, we need to get out, we need to relate to each other, but this truly is a pandemic and 200,000 Americans have perished already. That is not a small number. The projection is that it could double by year's end unless we stay the course of isolating and wearing masks. I'm, I'm glad to see in your survey that 93% of the people have acclimated to the idea of wearing masks that's very encouraging because, you know, that really can save lives. So, um, you know, I just want to say that I, I hope people really look at the survey and dive deep into it because there's a lot of very valuable information there. They kind of uh, tell us where, where we are now and helps us prepare for the future economically, certainly with our budget deliberations and socially as well, as we deal with, you know, our districts and our constituents, we have to be mindful of the effects of this pandemic. They are pretty far reaching. And I think your report really shows that. So Jorge, thank you very much. And I would like to um, move the item uh, because I think it's a great piece of work. All right, is there a second on uh, the motion? Sure, second. There's a second by Council Member Carr. Are there are other members that would like to weigh in. I, I think it's a great piece of work. I think it's really important that we take the pulse of our community as frequently as possible. Although the members here, I, I think, understand the pulse of their community better than uh, be better than anyone. It's evidenced by, in a way, anticipating this the results and the way that you put together the the CARES Act uh, relief fund package. Um, and Jeff's right, I mean, we've got a long way to go before uh, we return to anything that resembles a semblance of normal. And we're going to have to keep figuring out creative ways that we can assist our small businesses and our working people and our community-based organizations, our nonprofits um, and people who are struggling in everyday life. Um, hopefully we get more help eventually from the federal government, uh, another CARES package, but whether we do or whether we don't, um, I, our work is just beginning. And I think the survey tells us that, we didn't need it to tell us that, but it certainly confirms what we already know. So second, and let's call the roll. Um, Council Member Carr. I'm Council sorry. Carr the... Go ahead, Council Member Carr. I can go after you. Okay, sorry. Go, go. Thank you, Mayor. 
Well, I certainly thought the survey was a validation of what we know and what we uh, have experienced. Um, a couple of things really jumped out at me though. One, uh, just like the scientific survey that Jorge conducted, uh, this one was much more specific. It didn't address public safety. It addressed police, fire, and emergency response. And just like the scientific survey that Jorge has conducted, we see uh, in this survey that people really do not want money cut to those organizations. Uh, we've experienced here on the council, people coming and demanding in one form or another that we look at um, under the guise of re uh, defunding, that we look at those things, but the vast majority of people really want those services. And it really jumps out at uh, on this survey. Uh, Jorge, I'd like to ask you, has anyone from the Measure U committee reached out to you? Because they came to us saying that they wanted more polling and they wanted something called participatory budgeting. And I've looked into it a little bit to try to figure out what it is they're talking about when they use that term, participatory budgeting. And uh, they get a, gr a group of people together who go out and evidently have forums. And then, uh, after they finish this forum process, they vote and those votes are supposed to be binding on uh, how we form a budget. Have they talked to you? Have you looked into this at all? I recently received an email from one of the members of the Measure U uh, committee and uh, we are trying to schedule a meeting for sometime next week to get together and discuss the issues and concerns that they have. Well, could you get back with us on um, what your take is on what it is they're asking us to do, how sure. it works? Uh, it seems to me that the scientific polling that you do every year where you benchmark the city against all of the other cities uh, in the United States and where we stand and where people, what people think about the services that are being provided by the city, it seems like to me that that's that's much more of a, a guidepost for us than a group of people who get together with folks who normally don't participate and then uh, develop a budget that's supposed to be binding. If, and I could have, my take on that could be all wrong. So I, if you would look into that, give us an analysis of what it means, how it would operate, what they're proposing in Sacramento and whether or not there's any, um, scientific validity for what they're proposing that should bind us as a council on how we uh, do the budget. Um, yeah, I can get back to you with that. The, the mass thing, I know, Mayor, I've heard you mention that at one point you wanted to um, make it mandatory to wear masks. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing from this poll is that people are already doing that. They really are in my community, they are wearing the mask. Here's what's not happening. When you go to a store, you see people with masks on. When you go to any uh, public event, uh, I see people with masks. What they're not doing is socially isolating. People are going back home and having house parties. They're mixing uh, residences. Uh, they're getting together with their friends in their homes. And when they do that, of course, they're not wearing the mask. And I think that's a point that, um, we need to have our TR people really push in our campaign that the masks are not only for home, not only for when you go to CVS, but they also, um, when you are with people who are not in your personal bubble, that you have to protect yourself. And that's where I think we are as a community falling up a little short. Now, Jorge, yeah. we, al we also talked about uh, participation. And I see that it's distressing to me that participation in DA is only 2%. And I know you've oversampled uh, just to get that 2%. Is there anything else that we can do to increase the participation, especially for DA? I'd like to at least get up to Alan Warren's and have 5%. <laughs> well, um, hey, man, don't be calling that. me out, man, like that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm giving you kudos. You. Three points above me. 
the, the good news, council member uh, Carr, on that front is that when we did do our last community survey uh, for um, Council District 8, we sent out almost uh, double the number of uh, surveys to Council District 8 to get the level of participation on par with the other council districts. And we are, were able to significantly increase the number of responses that we received. I think we've uh, learned quite a bit uh, based on our prior uh, efforts on how we might be able to bring up those numbers. And so when we go to do the community survey again um, in this next year, we will deploy similar um, tools to increase participation rate in any of those council districts that we've noticed a pattern of low participation to try to receive a statistically valid number of responses so that we can rely on the results a little better. Okay, thank you. So Mr. City Manager, uh, the request is that in our PR campaign that uh, we focus, some, put some attention on uh, mingling of households and how that's contributing to the spread of the virus. Of course, I'd like you to do that in coordination with the county health officer. And if they don't think it's a problem, then don't pursue it. But if it is, I think we need to put some energy in our PR effort to uh, make sure people understand that the mingling of households is actually spreading the virus. The house parties, the graduation parties, the celebrations, the birthday parties, uh, that's where people are not wearing masks, in my opinion. But I'd like for you to take a look at look at that work in conjunction with our health officials, see if that's a, a concern. And if so, let's put some energy in our PR effort. Absolutely. I'll include that as part of our work plan, and I will reach out to the county as well. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much, Council Mayor. Uh, Mayor Pertem Ashby. Mayor, I just uh, be really quick with this. I wanted to thank Jorge and also note that I have never in 10 years, he already knows I'm going to say, heard Jorge express a personal opinion <laughs> based on his own <laughs> audit before in my life. So that's a pretty big compliment, you guys, when Jorge tells us that he thinks that we're doing a good job. I literally in 10 years have never once heard him express an opinion uh, on an audit. So I just want to point that out, Jorge, and say thank you. That's that's a tough nut to crack right there. So thank you for that one. And then I agree with Councilmember Carr's comments. Those are really important comments, both about you know where people are feeling in terms of public safety and mental health and school and access and all of that. And I'm, re I'm really proud of this council too. I, I've watched this sort of diverse um, expenditures and I think it's working, I really do. And Jorge, my district was lower than they normally are in participation. I have a couple theories on that. One is, you know, I'm in the land of parents trying to help kids with uh, Zoom school, which everyone is, except for that Natomas school district starts a month earlier than Sac City and the others. So they may have been distracted sooner than Twin Rivers parents and Sac City unified parents. I would just encourage you to work with the council offices, every single one of us, because we know how to reach the district and I probably could help you get that number up a little bit, a little bit better. Um, at least in my area, I know I, I know I could, uh, just timing for one thing. Once school starts out here, which is the very first week of August, sort of shuts down. So uh, I don't know, um, besides that, what else I could tell you, it's a really great report and you, I love that you did two sort of rapid fire because they aligned with each other nicely and it really this one really justifies also the findings in the first one they're very similar they people's opinions didn't didn't change much so thank right. you for that Jorge and I agree with Councilmember Carr's comments welcome thank you anybody else yeah just a quick one yeah. I, I need to apologize for my colleagues that my constituents were so eager to respond to this survey 20% is a lot. We have very engaged residents and obviously care a lot about this. So I don't know um, how that affects the results, but I am glad um, that largely the survey reflects the things we have prioritized. And, you know, this has been a, a hard six months for everybody trying to work through the pandemic. But I do think, uh, to your point, Jorge, um, 
the survey results do validate the approach we've taken and other jurisdictions around the country haven't done it quite the same way. But in the end, it sounds like we are um, walking and chewing gum or whatever the right analogy is and through this pandemic and economic uh, collapse and everything else going on. So um, I think it's, it's good to see those results, even if my people are um, raising their hand too much. Thank you, council member. Never be too engaged. And can, and can I say, Mr. Mayor, yes. it, was, it was daunting when we received the $89 million to try to figure out how we would decide where that money would go. When you took the bull by the horns and established the pots uh, of money and how they should be dedicated, that was the guidance this council really needed in order to wrap its head around how we were going to distribute the funds. So I applaud you for your leadership on that issue. Well, thank you very much, Councilmember Carr. Really, really appreciate that. I really do. It's uh, did what I thought was right. And the one thing this council committed itself to is investing these resources in the community where the need is the greatest. And that, uh, it, and that really stands out. So thank you. Anybody else? Okay, there's a motion and a second. Let's call the roll, please. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Ashby. Yes. Council Member Warren. Yes. Vice Mayor Harris. Aye. Council Member Hansen. Aye. Council Member Chenier. Aye. Council Member Gatta. Aye. Council Member Jennings. Aye. Council Member Carr. Aye. And Mayor Steinberg. Aye. All right. Um, that was a very important item. Let's move to the last item of uh, the late afternoon here, and that is item 29 on the shared writables. Jennifer? Good evening, Mayor and Council. I am about to share my screen. All right. Can you see my screen? And can you hear me? Wonderful. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Jennifer Donlin Wyatt, and I am your Transportation Planning Manager in Public Works. In April 2019, uh, you adopted our current fee and regulatory structure around shared rideables, which are shared bikes and scooters. And with adoption, you directed staff to come back with a report back to see how, we're, how well we are doing and how uh, are we meeting our goals. I'm presenting tonight, but I want to let you know this has been a collaboration between transportation, parking, IT, and the police department, and I'm glad to be working with the great partners. One of the concerns that you expressed, um, and one expressed by the operators, is that whether or not our fee and regulatory structure would discourage operators from coming to the city of Sacramento. I'm happy to say that we currently have three operators in the city, Finn, Bird, and Lime, each with different numbers of devices in the current permit stage. Lime has inherited or acquired jump. Um, so that's why you might see that here for a total of 22,170 devices. And I just issued a new permit to Razor, Razor scooters. So we shall be seeing those on uh, our streets pretty soon. You can also see here on our map of our service area, they all primarily serve the core of the city, um, but we do require that they work in 20%, um, deploy 20% of their devices toward disadvantage or opportunity areas. Those are the areas that you see in blue. We've had a great run. Um, when we first adopted the ordinance, we saw a uh, increase in the number of devices and the number of operators, as you can see here, by the number of trips that we've taken in a year since the ordinance was adopted. We expected a decline in the rainy months um, in December, and we, we saw that. And then with the pandemic in March, all the operators voluntarily pulled their devices off the street. And we worked with them to return devices at the end of June, and we're starting to see that uptick again of activity happening. We work closely with our IT department, and I have to give uh, many thanks to them with working for us. We have uh, with us, we have a new data language called Mobility Data Specification that collects the data from these devices um, and tells us and gives us information on all the metrics that you asked for, such as the number of devices, number of trips. Uh, average trip time distance and whether or not they start or end at a transit stop, including how many 301 calls we receive. Uh, one of the key parts of the data dashboard shows activity. We do not collect information on individual user trips, but instead collect activity by block 
as you can see here, the darker areas are where we see the greatest activity and then it graduates lighter to less activity. The core of the city is seeing a lot of this activity. We can get to the fine granular detail by zooming in. Um, so much of the, these are so popular that on this one block in six months, we had 26,000 trips uh, that happened on this block. Uh, that also helps inform our planning and whether or not we need some bikeway infrastructure to ensure that people aren't scooting on the sidewalk. We also collect data on where people end their trips. We want to have data-driven decisions about where we install the bike parking. You can see here the darker red and pink are where people are ending their trips. Uh, we use that information to determine where we need parking. Again, we can get into that finer level of detail. And on this one block, it's R Street. It's a pretty exciting area. We had in six months over 9,200 parking events that averages to about 51 every day. One of the key issues we do have around them are the parking of the devices. We've had over 3,000 complaints to 311 since we started operating. Uh, these devices, about 1,400 in the first six months of the ordinance. Um, we're working to address those. One of our biggest challenges are in the single family residential areas, as you can see in the photo on the inset, where we don't have great opportunities to provide bike racks, um, where we have you know, sidewalks and then a street without a landscape strip. We've done a lot at the city to address parking. I'm gonna go into what the vendors and the operators are required to do. The transportation parking in the police department did a lot of outreach last fall in person on the street, engaging with people who are using the scooters. We also created some great videos and deployed those on social media and then engaged with our media outlets to get that information out there to the general public. We've also created parking. So we've collected about $58,000 in fees to create parking and so far have installed 106 parking spaces with three drop zones. And then we've worked closely with our parking division. Um, they love technology and, and have done a great job. They reached out with one of their vendors to do the software for their handheld citations and mo uh, modify the, the handheld to be able to issue citations just like to a parked car to a parked scooter or a parked bicycle that is blocking the pedestrian path of travel so that our sidewalks are kept clear. Another one of the key issues is scooting on sidewalks. California law prohibits the use of the electric scooters on sidewalks. And we keep track, so as part of our education campaign, we also told folks about that and we did that last fall. We also hold our companies accountable to what they promise to do around education and how well they are doing. They're so doing okay. Uh, we hope that they can do a little bit better. And then our police department has issued a, a whole number of warnings and issued 30 citations for scooting on the sidewalk. Those citations are pretty expensive at $207. That's something we want to consider when we uh, address those citations. Other issues that we know about, uh, underage riding. California law requires that a scooter user must have a driver's learner's permit. And all of our operators have regulations that you must be 18 years or old, um, 18 years or older. Uh, to use their devices. However, as you can see from these images, they're blurred out, so you can't tell who the children are, but we have a number of children who are using the devices. And if they do use them, California law requires that they wear a helmet. One of the things that was really important to you when we talked last year was that we ensure equitable outcomes. And so the way that we did that was we identified our opportunities areas in the city, which are SACOG environmental justice areas, and that we require 20% of their devices be deployed to these areas every day. Um, and the companies have generally met them. Jump under Uber was not meeting them, but they were getting pretty close. Instead of 20%, they were at 19.6. But all the other companies have met them. And in fact, Finn is almost at 25% of their devices deployed are in opportunity areas. And that's something that we're monitoring to ensure that we're meeting your objectives. And Jennifer, could I ask real quick, what, do you know what the usage was in those areas? compared to the, the core? Council Member Chenier, I don't have an information on use in that, but it is something that we can look into. Our data dashboard was recently completed and with that data, we can, with the dashboard, we can run that analysis. It, it would just be interesting to see what their profit margins are, their usage margins in those areas versus the core. Well, what we can see is if I go back to my, not to go too off topic, but our levels of activity, uh, the levels of activity are not in our opportunity areas. And so they're likely seeing fewer trips and therefore a less of a profit uh, in those areas. I, but we I assume fewer devices that are there as well. Correct. So yeah, there are also fewer devices there. Our fee structure though does have reduced fees for operating in our opportunity areas. 
Um, and with that, that's actually my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions that the community or the council has. Thank you so much. All right. Do we have uh, public testimony? Yes, Mr. Mayor, I have five callers on this item. Okay, let's hear. Thank you. First caller, please. Welcome to the meeting. You have two minutes to address the council. Good evening. My name is Carlo Wane, Director of Government Relations, Southwest at Mine. I am here to give public comment on item 29. First off, I just want to thank the Sacramento City Council for allowing me to speak today. Mine relaunched services in the city of Sacramento within the last month as a regional bike share operator with both our jump bikes and our line scooters. We are really grateful to be able to bring back our operational expertise to the Sacramento community and sincerely appreciate the public-private partnership that we have formed and we look forward to building upon it. Since our relaunch, we have seen a consistent increase in ridership even as we have scaled up our fleet and despite the challenging air quality that the community has recently been faced with. We look forward to expanding bike share throughout the city and we're encouraged to see the community continue to benefit from our environmentally friendly multimodal. Our country's mission is to connect people to one another, something that is a distinct challenge during these uncertain times. Operations under the Shared Rideables program has demonstrated that shared micromobility plays a valuable role in bringing traffic to small businesses and getting residents, students, and tourists around the city. Shared micromobility trips have amounted to over 1.2 million trips in the last year. And as noted in stats report, each of these trips is a step towards the city reaching its climate action plan goals by providing mobility choices beyond driving and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. With that in mind, and as the industry continues to deal with this global pandemic, we respectfully request that the city have as flexible of a framework as possible to ensure that shared micromobility remains a viable long-term transportation option for the city. We look forward to the ongoing collaboration as we work in partnership with California's capital city. We appreciate the continued efforts of city staff to work collaboratively with the shared micromobility industry to identify best practices and ensure that this green transportation option can continue to provide the level of service that Sacramento has come to expect for the long term. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Next caller, please. Welcome to the meeting. You have two minutes to address the council. I've got the thing blank, so I cannot hear what you are saying, but Mayor, this is not the last item. Public comment is, but to the rest of you, to Jennifer, um, I, most of your broadcast came through very choppy. I assume it's in my end, so I would appreciate if you could send me a PowerPoint presentation of what you, in a sense, said and did. But I am talking about from the 4th District, Steve Hansen's district, and from Old Sacramento, to City Hall. And my comment is, where are the parking spots for the scooters? Because they are getting left around the uh, Amtrak station. They are getting left around the Toco station. They are getting left uh, right now bird in line um, in the sidewalks and sometimes where the crosswalks are at. So they do interfere. Please get that matter addressed. Um, I will also comment that uh, uh, this is wonderful to see less, but more. So you said in July there was 40,000 rides. Impressive um, through here, and now it is September. Um, but comment is around the uh, uh, ride share as it's come back. Uh, please make sure, and if you can get some damn maps out there suggesting where these are to be parked, drop off, and where to find them, uh, it would also be appreciated. And I know that previously uh, with Uber, there was a matter of you could determine where some of these were at. I do not know whether you're going to have an electronic mapping system again in the city of Sacramento that suggests where these scooters are available at. And I appreciate all the concerns that you once again brought up. And I will um, certainly bring on October 7th when the city's Disability Advisory Commission re-meets for the first time in this pandemic. Um, 
to that this matter is of concern. Thank you for your comments. Your time is complete. Will you make your final comment, please? That's my end of my comment, and then I will try to get off the phone and get back on for. Thank you for your comments. Next item. caller, please. Welcome to the meeting. You have two minutes to address the council. Good evening, Mayor Steinberg and City Council members. My name is Tim Harder, Senior Regional Manager of Government Partnerships for Burden, California. I would like to start by thanking city staff and city council members for working with us during this unprecedented time to bring micromobility back to Sacramento. During COVID, we've seen more people look to open air and socially distant mobility options, such as Birdie scooters. It's important to ensure that we have a sustainable operation in Sacramento, and I want to share our thoughts on the current fee structure in Sacramento. Earlier today, the industry shared a joint letter with council members that explains our concerns around quarterly per rise fees that must be paid in advance. Many cities during COVID have waived or significantly reduced these fees charged to operators during the health emergency orders, the late ongoing pandemic. For example, during the previous quarter, we only had taken 18.8% of the rides that we were charged for. While we are meeting our 20% deployment requirement can reduce the concern, we also ask the city explore subsidies for operators to place additional vehicles in these areas and other neighborhoods throughout the city. We're also currently offering free rides for essential workers, including teachers in Sacramento, to ensure the Sacramento workforce has access to affordable, clean air mobility. We have one ask that the per ride parking quarterly fees be waived during the remainder of the emergency order and that staff be granted more flexibility in managing the program without having to pre-collect fees in advance. Just as any other business, we have to ensure we have sustainable operation. Fees waived or reduced ride fees and charged at the end of the quarter to provide us much more stability in Sacramento as we better, better understand the new normal. We very much appreciate our partnership with Sacramento and look forward to continuing to make Sacramento a multi-modal city while reducing traffic and car trips. Thank you for your time and I'll stick around for any questions. Thank you for your comments. Next caller, please. Welcome to the meeting. You have two minutes to address the council. Dear, uh, I Mr. Mayor and city council members, my name is Gene Lozano. I'm the second vice president of the ACB Capital Chapter of the California Council of the Blind. Um, we are in support of the use of alternative transportation, uh, such as the electric scooters and bicycles, um, though we would like them to not be operated on the sidewalk because of the hazards. The I know you're looking at fees right now, but part of the issue is you heard complaints about um, vehicles, these this devices being parked uh, not, uh, all over the, the community outside of the designated parking spots and become tripping hazards for people, particularly those with visual impairments or obstacles or people trying to get around them. We have the barrier of not being able to identify these devices. So when we call 311 to report the presence of a device, we would, uh, there's no way for us to identify what manufacturer it is, the company that has it, the uh, ID number. And we really would like to see incorporated into your operating plan for this whole uh, project that there be tactile signs placed on each device that identifies the company the a number assigned to the device um, so that we can then use that for reporting. And this would be raised print and braille following the building code requirements for permanent signage. This would give us an opportunity to at least maybe help the community to enforce um, regulations so that um, it's safer for everyone. So thank you very much for your time and consideration and we would be happy to work with the city in pushing for um, signage that is badly needed in reporting. Thank you. Good evening. Thank, thank you for your comments. All right. Thank you. A lot of uh, important issues raised by uh, the callers, both from the industry and from the public. Uh, Jennifer, do you want to respond to any of uh, what, you, what you heard from the public before I turn it to the council members? Mr. Mayor, I think I'm good. I'd like to hear from the council members and then I can address their questions. Okay, very good. Who, 
who is uh, who wants to speak? Councilmember Council, Council Member Hansen, Carr, Harris, and then Guetta. Okay, let's go in that order, please. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Uh, first, I want to thank Jennifer for um, embarking on what was a very uh, challenging process to create the ordinance that we reviewed and approved a little over a year ago, year and a half ago, I guess. Um, because we started with just bikes and then obviously we had to deal with a lot of other challenges. And Jennifer, you and your team have done a tremendous job. If I remember right, at the time we adopted that ordinance, not only was there a lot of concern about how these devices would roll out from the community, but the operators themselves said that our permit structure, our fees would dissuade them so much that nobody would operate in Sacramento. And so I think it's the good news that we've got four permits out now, obviously the, the coronavirus pandemic took a big chunk out of um, what would have probably been a very different year for shared rideables. Um, but I, I hope that now that they've been redeployed and provide a very important alternative means of transportation um, that we continue to see growth there. Um, obviously in the meantime, we've adopted our climate commission recommendations and this is a key piece of that, uh, reducing uh, vehicle miles traveled and um, uh, gas uh, transportation, gas and diesel, gasoline and diesel transportation mode. So this is a very important piece of it. I also think, you know, um, Council Member Harris, Vice Mayor Harris and I served on the bike share PSC for quite a long time, working with West Sacramento and Davis to help bring these, this, this system to the region through SACOG um, grants originally with bike share. And um, I, I'm very happy to see um, jump bikes back out, even though they're now run by Lyme. And, um, you know, there, there's just a lot of different things that have been going on. I, I, as we have this conversation today, I think certainly the um, disadvantaged community piece of this is important. One of the things I noticed um, is that all of the areas are contiguous. And when we adopted the ordinance in, um, 2019, I'd assume that some operators would create a um, contiguous area because they want to have the number of trips in the central city or the adjacent areas, but that they would then maybe create a bubble or a, a operations area in the south or the north or the east and other places where we had disadvantaged communities. Is there a reason that they're all contiguous and we don't see more of the operators choosing to deploy um, in um, sort of, I don't, I don't know, non-contiguous areas? Council Member Hansen, that's a great question. And I'm not sure if I can answer that. There's no regulatory framework that we have that would prohibit that. So should Jennifer's Scooter Company want to operate ex exclusively in the Meadowview area, for example, I could have that option, which is they have chosen not to, and as private businesses, we, we allow them to choose where they operate. Um, okay, how would how would you assess this? I know we are trying to learn a lot of lessons from other cities and hearing, um, honestly, some of the very upset um, public officials, the residents who weren't pleased with how things are going. Do you think that the current ordinance largely gives us the tools to manage this well, or do you think we need some changes here? Councilmember Hansen, I think that overall our program is doing relatively well. So we have four operators. We have a lot of activity pre-COVID. Uh, we were doing fabulously. I think there are opportunities to, to address some of the challenges that we see primarily around parking and scooting on sidewalks. I think that we could probably include some additional leverage in the ordinance to get better outcomes um, so that uh, those with disabilities who need to be able to use the sidewalk are able to do so. Um, free and clear, and then create solutions for parking in our single family residential areas. Uh, and the fees that pay for the parking currently are that per trip fee. Do you know, just speaking of sidewalks, um, earlier this year, Jump was supposed to launch a new technology. They had mapped all of our sidewalks so that um, the user would be sent an alert um, or some signal through the device that they were in an inappropriate area given the transfer of jump to Lyme, do you know where that stands in rolling out that technology? Because I think that would be a big game changer in addressing some of the concerns about sidewalks. So Council Member Hansen, we were working in collaboration with Uber on that technology that they were piloting in the city. And that one of that steps was to map the city. 
they hadn't gotten far enough to be able to deploy it when Uber sold Jump to Lime. My understanding is, is that that was never completed and therefore didn't transfer over. However, I do understand that Lime has a similar process for their scooters and they were piloting that in San Jose. I don't know yet if that has been completed or if that will be available to us. And then um, when you briefed me on this, one of the things I heard, we had created a parking citation for inappropriate parking and we had assumed that that would be passed on to the user as a way to create deterrence from bad behavior. But what I understand is that the companies are paying that fee and not passing it on to the user. So the user's not really benefiting from the deterrence of getting a parking ticket, for instance, um, when they leave their scooter in the path of travel. Um, is that is that something that you're uh, suggesting that we look at ways to change? Um, I know you sort of mentioned that in passing, but I, I'd like to understand what you think is the best approach there vis-a-vis -vis our ordinance and um, cleaning up some of those behaviors that are problematic. Certainly, Council Member Hansen, that is a significant concern. The, the objective of creating that parking citation, which is $27.50 uh, per um, issue, was to get better behavior. We don't want to collect the dollars, but the, the intended outcome is better behavior. And with the companies not passing those fees on to the user, we're not getting the outcomes that we wanted. So what we are hoping is with, uh, if we do go and revise the ordinance that we address that uh, and working with our city attorney's office uh, on how ways that we can achieve better outcomes. Yeah, and, and I, I guess the reason I bring that up, our fee is actually $15, but the state tax another 1250 yeah. onto it, which I think is sort of atrocious that there's almost a hundred dollars or a hundred percent state surcharge on there. But the, um, the companies in, in reaching out to us through their letters and other things have suggested that our fee structure is too much, but then I hear that they're absorbing the cost of these tickets rather than passing them through. So it makes me wonder um, where the balance might lie. But I do think that there is some worth in moving at least during our COVID times from the prepaid version of the fee structure for trips to potentially an invoicing model um, because it does seem prudent that if trips have dropped so dramatically um, that many of the companies have prepaid far in excess of what they will actually owe us. And so rather than having to refund those dollars, we at least for a period of time, maybe in the next 12 months, go to a invoicing system to collect those fees after the fact. It's still really important to me that we support your division and the, the tremendous amount of work that you've had to do to sort of manage this new uh, form of mobility. And I tell you, I'm grateful because before we had the resource from your team paid for by these fees, our office, my office, and probably a lot of our other colleagues got um, blizzards of complaints from constituents and others who were, had nowhere else to go except to plead their case to us. And it was very, um, it was very unworkable. I think is what I would say. And so I like that we are uh, we have a, a policy system here and a framework that is uh, functional to deal with the complaints and the opportunities. And um, maybe the last thing I'd say is um, while, we, while we hope to see companies increase their presence and get more devices out to provide mobility, I do think it's important as companies come in for permits that we, uh, whether we revisit the 20% and increase that or set priority areas beyond what's being served now um, in disadvantaged communities, I do think we need to adjust that framework so we get more devices into other parts of the city. Obviously, um, infrastructure is important, education is important, and not all those things are in place. Um, but at the same time, I do think that so many people are, are desperate for new forms of transit and in cities um, where transit was cut dramatically, people did turn to these devices as a way to get around. But uh, we've been able to sustain and um, just recently restore our transit service to full capacity. So this is not quite the same situation, but I would like to see how we do that. And um, I don't know if you plan to bring back ordinance changes or some recommendations through the administrative process, but I, I, I think we're heading in the right direction. We just need some tweaks. So thank you. Thank you, Council Member Hansen. Any change to the fee structure, I will defer to the city attorney's office on because it's uh, adopted by resolution. So I, I'm under the understanding that we have to go back and revisit that. 
And I'm also expecting that if you provide direction to staff tonight, that you'll go forward and work on those issues. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Hanson. I think who was next, Madam Clerk? I say I think I was, Mr. Mayor. Okay, go ahead. I agree with uh, Steve wholeheartedly on all the issues that he raised. We need to look at the fee structure, especially during the pandemic, the advanced fee structure is not working. Uh, for some reason, the uh, vendors are not passing on the uh, citations to the riders. And that's baffling to me as well. And maybe we should look at increasing the citations uh, to a level that the vendors would have to pass it on to the riders and not be able to eat it. I know you're gonna look into that with the city attorney. Uh, the scooter citations, are, uh, I'm blown away, two, over $200 for a citation for riding on the sidewalk. Uh, the thing I wanna just emphasize a little more is that we are not seeing the bikes and scooters in, in the south part of the city. I haven't seen one south of Fruit Ridge, though on the map you had two drop-offs south of Fruit Ridge. It's perfectly clear to me that the reason we're not seeing them is because those communities are uh, designed differently. They're not as dense. And vendors have less of an opportunity to make money. Uh, if there was money to be made, they would be there. Unfortunately, these are the parts of the city that we have promised to help that we promised to bring up. So if, Jennifer, if you could look into maybe a pilot program, and it doesn't have to be in District 8, but in a part of the city that's underserved, that is not as dense, that uh, has the, um, the roadway that will accommodate it, to see if we could run a pilot program in one of those districts to see how it works and to see what we would have to do as a city to subsidize the operation, if we could cut fees or if we could do some other things to make it profitable for a vendor to go into those underserved areas. Does that sound like it's something you could do? Councilmember Carr, I'm happy to look into that for you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilmember Carr. Who was next, Vice Mayor? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so, yeah, Steve brought up most of the salient points. What I would like to say, Jennifer, is we, we clearly have to adjust the behavior of the riders. And it seems like the way to do that is for the providers to pass on at least some of the ticketing burden for unlawful parking to the riders themselves. Perhaps one way we could do that is by saying that if we go to an invoicing method rather than prepaid, that that would be conditioned upon them passing on some of the ticketing burden to the riders. So I'd like you to think about that. It might not be the entire ticketing fee, but it should be a, you know, a portion of it because if we don't do that, we're not gonna change the behavior, which is exactly what we want to do. And we also know that the amount that the, uh, uh, like Lyme and Bird, the providers pay for these tickets is more than the amount of money that we capture by the prepaid fees. So it, it really doesn't make any sense uh, for them to worry about the, the prepaid thing and want to go for the invoicing when they're paying quite a bit more money for the tickets that are acquired by the unlawful behaviors in parking. You know, the, these, are, these are good programs. There, there's kinks that we try to work out. Of course, Uber lost a tremendous amount of money in, in the JUMP program. Um, and now, after, you know, now that we're in this pandemic and, and business models have changed dramatically, it's our hope that we can create a model by which people can actually make money and survive in the marketplace and provide shared rideables. So as we look for these solutions, we have to be fairly creative. So we know we need to change behavior. We know we need to make this profitable. We want to reach for equity and Larry's idea of trying to do a, a a pilot project, if we could encourage that with one or more of our providers, would be great. These are all really good suggestions, but I can say that I, I know that Steve and I really, really had a lot of problem with unlawful parking of the devices, 
both bikes and scooters. It was just almost a daily issue for us as council members receiving those kinds of calls. Yeah, some people call 311, but it's actually easier, I think, for a lot of people to call their council member. And they did in profusion. So we got a lot of those complaints. To me, a primary concern here is adjusting those behaviors. And I really think that if we move to an invoice system, we should just condition it upon charging at least part of the parking fees to, to the actual riders who are committing the offense to change the behavior. So those are my suggestions. Thank you, Jennifer. And, and thank you for doing a tremendous job. It's really uh, pretty amazing to me that you know, once the pandemic hit and we went from 163,000 rides to zero in just a few short months that we're already recovering. My last comment is this, are we requiring sanitation protocols of, of the providers? And what kind of education are we giving to people who, who uh, partake of shared rideables on how to protect themselves from spread of coronavirus through touch? Vice Mayor Harris, that's a great question. So in order for operators to come back in the times of COVID, we require that they agree to our sanitation protocol. Our sanitation protocols include educating and providing uh, PPE for their employees so that their employees are kept safe. Additionally, we require that they sanitize the devices in high, at the high touch surfaces at least twice a day. Uh, and that they encourage their customers to, to use gloves and to sanitize before and after using the devices. And then the city through our city express blog and social media have also shared out the same information and encouraging folks to either wear gloves and or use sanitation before and after they touch the devices. Okay, thank you very much, Jennifer. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Who is next, Madam Clerk? Council Member Guerra is the last colleague to speak. Council Member Guerra. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, one, I'd like to uh, also support uh, Council Member Hansen's um, uh, uh, comments as well. Uh, I right off the bat, uh, you know, just I recall my dad during the near the end of his his life, he uh, uh, he had lost most of his eyesight. So I want to first off make sure that we uh, address uh, the comments about those who are uh, you know uh, who are, who are in our community who this has become a real big impediment, uh, and uh, I making sure that we figure out that enforcement tool. Again, the, the issue of the citations is, uh, is critical because if we're not creating uh, or helping uh, just behavior, then uh, we're only gonna perpetuate some of these problems. So uh, to Council Member Harris's point, I think we have to figure out that immediately. Uh, also, there's a huge benefit to these, uh, these program, these, the, these types of, uh, uh, of shared writables because uh, in many parts of my district, it's at least, you know, two miles before you can get to a bus stop. Um, and we've been advocating and hope, hoping we can get smart riding in our district. But um, the, really the, the tool that this could provide is uh, connectivity and looking at multimodal options to be able to use a full network of solutions. It, and for those I know in my district who, um, uh, you know, can't afford a vehicle, uh, this this becomes a viable option. You know the the cost of a, owning a vehicle uh, between maintenance, insurance, gas, um, and uh, you, know, uh, you know, God forbid you get in an accident. I think those are those are uh, the, the cost to, to, to folks. It's a challenge, but being able to use the shared rideables really provides the resources. So when we're looking at the the fee structure uh, and how do we make them also. Uh, incentivize uh, larger exposure in the environmental justice areas. I want to figure out what what can we do to do that. So I do like the invoicing on the monthly side, but I also feel that that we've got to figure out uh, how to uh, how to make sure that there's an incentive to go into these other areas. Um, I know uh, predictability of where the 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 the, the devices are uh, helps at least with folks in my district know when and what, how to be able to access them. So, um, you know, I've discussed with some of the, the providers options of how to be able to look at, at uh, uh, predictable locations um, uh, to help. And I think they also can be a benefit for a lot of the small businesses in, uh, in some of our commercial corridors. So 
a lot of pros and uh, uh, with it, but the cons again, I think, are ensuring that we get a response to to appropriate usage. It's against the state law to ride on the sidewalk, so we have to be uh, we have to we're asking the the providers to do their part. I think the city must do its part, um, and uh, and I like the idea of, of continuing to look at pilot programs to fill the gaps in areas where we have a, a gap in transportation. We should start targeting those and saying, okay, where can we? We have low income. Uh, families who need transportation options. Let's figure out how do we can do some pilot programs in those areas. With that, I uh, uh, appreciate the uh, all the great work, uh, Jennifer. I think you and your team and, and our uh, have done great work on that. Thank you, Councilmember Gatta. Councilman Chenier. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a couple things really quickly, Jennifer. Great job on this. Um, uh, my understanding was getting the bikes back was a lot more difficult than getting the scooters that the companies are pretty willing to do scooters, but difficult on the bikes are more expensive or to buy they're more expensive to service and just all kinds of stuff. Um, but I think they're really important. So I want to make sure that that remains a priority. Not everyone is comfortable on the scooters. We want to really, promote uh, alternative ways of, of getting there and get it, keep those VMT down. So just want to make that uh, stay a priority for us. Um, the other thing is just, and we talked a little bit about this during the briefing, is making sure that we're utilizing technology as much as possible when we talk about where folks are, are riding their bikes and parking their bikes. Um, and maybe there's a pilot program in there someplace there are, our bikes are talking to our riders when they're not parked in the right place, uh, letting them know that there's a $27 ticket coming. Um, you know, I, I also, third and last thing for me is I want to, I want us to be careful. A lot of times we'll jump to, and we've done this in a, in a few other areas too, just raising the fees or raising the fines that we're doing on people. We are also, um, the city is part of a, a national group that's looking at fines and fees and what that does to people's lives. Um, so there's there's ramifications of doing that beyond educating people or punishing them for trying to change behavior in that way. I think there's better ways to do it. And we should just be very cognizant of that. But thanks for, for the job you do. And uh, do you feel like you have the direction you need on the fee programs and monthly invoices, all of that? I do. Thank you, Council Member Schneer. Okay, and then and I must be done. Yes. Anybody else uh, in terms of the city council? So what are, what are the next steps now? Um, I've heard all of this input about um, how we might modify our ordinance. We've heard requests on, uh, on modifying some of the fee structure. What, what do you do next and what do we do next? Mr. Mayor, I think there are a couple of steps that we can take. I'm going to collect all of the directions that you've given me, work with the city attorney's office to identify what can be done administratively, what needs to require going back to law and ledge and then back to you. Um, I also understand that we don't, we want to work with expediency. And I'll tell you, this is maybe my third time taking this ordinance through. Um, so I know the ropes now. I know how to work it quickly uh, to make sure, of course, the public process to engage in that. Um, so what I can do is talk with the city attorney's office and with uh, my department leadership, create a plan of action of moving forward, share that with you, um, maybe by email or memo, uh, and then start working on that process. Okay, so we'll hear back within what weeks do you think, or is it? I month? think if you can give me two weeks, that would be nice. Okay. I think that's more than reasonable. Um, great hearing. Thank you for your great work. And uh, I mean, this is one of the most exciting parts of Sacramento now. I mean, the emergence of these new technologies and what it means for our climate vision and our climate plan and just the buzz it creates and how easy it is now for people to get around at least parts of our city without having to drive single occupancy vehicles. It's just 
it, it's easy to just take it for granted what's happened, but it's, we shouldn't, it's a fabulous advance. Thank you. Mayor, I just want to say one thing super quick to not belabor this point, but I guess I just can't let her come up and speak without saying it, but I know my colleagues agree with me, but Jennifer is just an incredible employee and we are so fortunate to have her and to be able to keep her. None of this would be, I know they all, we all agree. She is, she's gold. Jennifer, Sacramento so, so lucky to have you. Thanks for every, you pour your heart and soul into this and it shows and we are so much better off because you're here and you chose to make this your home. So thank you for that. Could, could I just ask Jennifer to help us all with our room and our setup for Zoom? Because she she's multi-talented as it is very clear. Mayor Pro Tem Ashby, thank you. Council Member Hansen, that was my wife, not me. Um, okay, thank you very much. That uh, completes the item and that completes the agenda for today. Uh, are there, uh, let's take public comments on items not on the agenda. Do we have any, Madam Clerk? Yes, I do have callers for matters not on the agenda. How many? I, have, I believe I have five. Okay. May I have my first caller, please? Welcome to the meeting. You have two minutes to address the council. Thank you. My name is Jeff Garrigus. I live in District 3. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I'm assuming you can. Okay, I am a Great Plates delivery driver. I've been doing this for about four months. And I called to actually raise awareness for item number 25 on the consent calendar. But I wasn't connected with you guys, excuse me, with the council prior to your vote. Item 25 includes a delivery contract with paratransit and it excludes an existing workforce that has been connected to Great Place through Lyft and delivering meals for, I've been doing it for four months. And there are others and we wanted to raise awareness about this. I'm sorry that I couldn't get through, but there are other comments that were not addressed during this consent calendar. The item probably should have been pulled. So I wanted to make you aware of that. This virtual meeting, uh, at least at the first part of this meeting, uh, is not working as far as us getting our public comments in. But uh, we do a good job delivering plates. Again, we were linked through Lyft. Lyft submitted a bid. Uh, there's nothing in the staff report that really thoroughly analyzes how the bids were reviewed and the staff recommendation for the delivery service is based on, I think the language in the report is, is that paratransit has been delivering meals. Well, the Lyft drivers have been doing it also. And there are a number of us, we're an existing workforce and you just kind of ended that for us with your vote today. So we do a good job. We've done good things connecting with our customers, your residents, we're residents as well. Uh, we'd like that to be known. We'd like the comments that have been submitted to be responded to and please consider give more thought to the delivery contract thank you for your comments your time is complete will you make your final comment please this job has been a lifeline to me and others please reconsider some way to include existing delivery drivers with the great plate service thank you thank you for your comments next caller please Welcome to the meeting. You have two minutes to address the council. Hi there. My name is Sandra Kitchen and I live at 4415 Red Sea Lane. And I really am enjoying the Great Lake program. And um, I'm calling in in behalf of uh, the driver that drives, uh, that delivers the food. And he's such a wonderful person. I, I, he's always on time, always wears his mask. He always has on gloves. And I, I was saddened because, um, and he was too, because this, uh, I guess the 30th of this month 
supposedly is going to be his last day. So I, I really and truly have enjoyed his service. And uh, the city of uh, Sacramento has uh, hired some nice people for the delivery. So I hope that maybe his program may be extended. But anyway, thank you very much. And I am in District 1, I think, Natomas. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next caller, please. Yes. Welcome welcome to the meeting. You have two minutes to address the council. Yes, Mayor Steinberg. This is Jeff for your public comment, not on the agenda. What I'm going to encourage, remind you is come January, there is the point in time count. I would encourage much like the census, much like the many other things related to the homeless, that you please start encouraging putting the word out because with this pandemic, it is going to be extremely hard to determine whom is homeless. And for the rest of you, I hope you let the other members know what does vehicle mean to the homeless? There are two explanations. I hope that you're ready to offer it. And lastly, I will remind you that October 7th, that we should be having a, should we say, Disability Advisory Council of the city meeting for the first time. And the issues you've heard, as well as other issues that need to be brought up to the Disability Advisory Committee. And as you also get to see, is where, what my telephone reception like, and what you sound to me is probably very much like I am sounding to you. It's terrible reception. I hope that you're going to be able to do better in the future for public comment. Thank you. That's my public comment for tonight. And I will be sure to let, uh, should we say, Mr. Uh, Robert Copeland know that he needs to get back talking with you. Uh, Jeff, we heard you loud and clear. Thank you for calling. Well, it's a next caller, please. Welcome to the meeting. You have two minutes to address the council. Hello, yes, my name is Lambert Davis Jr. up to the Bay of Back Cheesecakes. And I wanted to make the mayor and, and my city councilman Warren and everybody else aware that sometimes I'm in the queue and they don't let me in. Like when Measure U committee was there, I was never let into the queue. I think it's intentional because I wanted to talk to them or make them aware of us. So if somebody's staff would contact me and let me know their number. I also wanted to say to Mayor Steinberg that it was wonderful what you did regarding Wells Fargo. And I'm experiencing the same thing. When you have a CARES Act of $89 million and not one penny go to, to, to the Bay and Back Cheesecakes, which is in a so-called disadvantaged community and you're promoting inclusive economics, people should be ashamed of themselves. And then I listened to a survey earlier. It was 137 people. What type of people were they? 137 people in Sacramento? I grew up here. There's way more people in Del Paso Heights, 137. And so all I'm saying is now it's time for uh, if the mayor wants us to vote for the Mayor Accountability Act, which people I know are leaning that way, he should uh, organize with the city council and demand that to the Bay and Back Cheesecakes be funded. We just were endorsed by the Better Business Bureau president and CEO. That's a huge endorsement. That establishes integrity. Nobody can question that endorsement. So I hope that of that 89 million, we get some of that funding. We're ready to hire people and we guarantee employment. We guarantee profit. We guarantee taxes, revenue, everything. A computer can Thank you for your comments. Your time is complete. Will you make your final comment? Yes, the fund to the being back out of that 89 million. Thank you. Thank, thank you for thank your you. comments. Mr. Davis, I, I hear you. Let's. We'll look into this. I have um, no more. I have no more callers. So, 
I just want to address, if I may, thank you, Madam Clerk, um, the issue of the Lyft drivers, because we've had a number of uh, uh, of the seniors obviously call in tonight. We heard from one of the drivers, and uh, it's an important issue. Here is what has happened. Um, the federal, we have extended the Great Plates program, as you know, several times. And as we have extended it, the federal government has required um, some additional uh, 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 regulatory action on our behalf specifically. We can no longer just decide unilaterally who we want to contract with. We have to put out a request for proposals and make sure that every part of this, from, uh, from delivery um, to uh, uh, driver launch, volunteer management services, all of it is uh, bid competitively. And so we did that for the drivers and we received bids from several delivery service firms along with an option for restaurants uh, to provide their own drivers. And based on the bids submitted, the, the panel objectively looked at that and recommended that delivery services be provided by paratransit our nonprofit transportation provider for uh, the elderly and people with disabilities uh, with United Cerebral Palsy as the subcontractor to them. They will have been chosen to drive the 20 routes and provide aids for most of the routes with a limited number of volunteers needed to make uh, the deliveries. Lyft did submit a bid in partnership with a nonprofit from San Diego. The proposal was considered, but it was not as competitive as the winning proposal, uh, in part because the other proposals had more details around logistics, administration, and volunteer uh, launch services for the same price. And so this is, I understand the concern, but the, the process was followed in the letter, but also the intent, because we have to judge over time what is going to be the best, what is going to be the best service provider. And it is no uh, criticism of Lyft in any way. In fact, we're very appreciative of Lyft and the drivers, but we're going in this direction based upon an objective competitive process. And the council rarely, if ever, overturns a decision made that is based on that kind of objective recommendation because that would be playing favorites in a way that would be uh, unfair. We have to rely on the expert advice. I have faith in the expert advice and recommendation that we received. And this is the public process. So I just wanted to explain that uh, to the people that called in and anyone else who has a similar concern. Any other council members' uh, ideas and questions on any items? Council Member Harris and then Mayor Pro Tem Ashby. Okay. Vice Mayor Harris. Thank you, Mayor. I have a couple of announcements. Um, I'm sure that my colleagues remember that we dedicated Station 15 in South Natomas a year ago, a little over a year ago. Of course, part of producing a public building is producing public art, and we are going to have a virtual public art opening tomorrow evening. The Nighthawk Over Waters Public Art Dedication Event happens tomorrow, Wednesday, 23rd, from 6 to 7 p.m., and you can get details on that on my District 3 Facebook page. It's going to be pretty novel. You know, the Nighthawk is the symbol of Natomas, and I think this, this piece of public art is pretty darn exciting. It's really a pity that we can't all gather there in person, but we're going to give it a shot virtually. So please look into that and join the event. I'd like to thank Stanford Settlement, a tremendous organization. They've been organizing a food giveaway and mass drive. Uh, it's been very successful, and they're going to do it again tomorrow, September 23rd, from 1.30 to 4.30 p.m., uh, participants will need to register in advance by calling 916-927-1303. Or for more information, you can email Katrina, Katrina at stanfordsettlement.org. 
So, um, you know, they've been feeding people and giving them PPE in, in South Natomas, Gardenland, Northgate. It's a tremendous program. And thank you, Julie Roten and Stanford Settlement for all you do for the community. Lastly, uh, there's a guy up in Northgate named Roberto Ramirez who took it upon himself to say, you know, we need to clean up our neighborhood. So he's organized two community volunteer cleanups. Of course, they couldn't have happened without my staffer, Jocelyn Navarro. And uh, I would just like to say thank you. We had the second Northgate Gardenland cleanup this last Saturday. It was great success. It's been really well populated and Northgate is cleaner for the effort of all the community volunteers. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Who's next, Madam Clerk? Mayor Pro Tem Ashby. Okay. Thanks, Mayor. Also, thanks for hanging in there with my daughters in, in here with me tonight. And she is she's over this meeting more than more than any of us for sure. She's ready for me to be done. Sorry. So the paper airplanes flying over my head and whatnot. But uh, anyway, she's been a trooper all night since this afternoon. I just wanted to take a second, Mayor, to say that you know I can't help as I listen to the, our seniors in our city call in about their Lyft drivers, uh, I can't help but think about the amazing program that Rick Jennings does such a great job of supporting in his district, Meals on Wheels, and how, you know, we just listened to this report from our auditor about how mental health is just a, you know, a tick away from the physical health dangers of COVID-19. We all know that. That's why we've poured funding into it. And uh, I, I'm all for paratransit. I think they're a wonderful organization, but let's let's ask Tiffany Fink, let's share with her these issues that we've heard because I think at the root of what we're hearing is that these drivers are checking in on these seniors and they're talking to them, which is part of the Meals on Wheels program, right? That you don't just take them a meal, but that the driver talks to the people, gets to know them, meets them. And a lot of our seniors are really isolated. So I just think, you know, Tiffany will do a great job with this. She's an amazing CEO. And we just need to let her know that that's something that we need. And if we need to add funding to the program to have people go out with the paratransit drivers to just physically talk to these folks, I, I think that could be a really important mental health component to what we're doing. And I, we've probably already allocated funding in a bucket that would be appropriate for that use you and several others, Mayor, have all championed mental health on this. And I definitely think um, that fits squarely in that category. The Great Plates program has been fantastic. Julia Burroughs has done a wonderful job. I think uh, it's a compliment to you and really to the whole city. It has become more than just a food distribution program. It's become a check-in on our seniors program. And I think that's what we're hearing tonight from these Lyft drivers and community members that have gotten attached to their Lyft drivers, which is really sweet. So, and then lastly, from my district, I just want to say, you know, in my council office runs a farmer's market, which is remarkable in non-COVID times. I just want to take one moment to acknowledge my incredible staff, particularly uh, Deanna, who you all know. She has been running a farmer's market that <laughs> it, it, it averages about 1,400 visitors every Saturday morning, and she's just running it out of our office it is one of the only certified farmer's markets in the city. She added an extra month onto it, so it'll go into the first weekend of October. She also runs a free yoga in the park class that where people social distance on Saturday mornings. This is every Saturday morning in the regional park in North Natomas, and people are more than welcome to come out and enjoy it. But really, I just wanted to take a minute to thank her and her incredible dedication to work with whatever the county rules are masks and having our youth out there and enforcing rules and hand washing stations and all the things that it takes to be able to continue to help the farmers in our region get their food to the plates of the people in our districts. I'm really proud of my team. So thank you for that, Mayor. Thank you. And I'm sure, by the way, I think you're actually right the paratransit, but geez, I, I've and I went on some early rides with the paratransit folks. I, I, I have no doubt that they are going to provide that uh, same level of personalized attention and service to the seniors in great place. But let's reaffirm and confirm that that is, uh, is the case. Let's uh, go next. Who's next? 
Councilmember Jennings and then Councilmember Hansen. Thank, thank you, Mayor. I just want to kind of um, let you know what's going on in District 7. One of the things that's going on in District 7, uh, from a history lesson, when many of our communities were um, originated, uh, the car was the predominant form of transportation. And now we see uh, walkable communities, we see more bikes, we see more scooters, and we see people riding transit. So I'm saying all that to say that District 7 in the Pocket Greenhaven area has a transportation study going on right now. We want to make sure we hear from all residents in District 7 so we can understand how we can transform transportation for the future and also understand what are the related challenges that each area has going on right now. We've had uh, two virtual community listening sessions and uh, they have been incredible. Uh, there are more being planned. We have a timeline of everything that's going to go on and how the community can get involved. So I just want to let all the constituents of Pocket Greenhaven area know that they can go on the website at planpocketgreenhaven.org. Once again, that's planpocketgreenhaven.org. They can weigh in. They can go and, and let us know what are the areas they're most concerned with. So they don't have to wait for the listening sessions. They can be proactive in participating in the transportation study right now. And I want to thank Jennifer as well for a great job that she's leading from the Public Works Department uh, in helping us make this possible. So that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Jennings. Councilmember Hansen. Thank you, Mayor. I have an adjourn in memory for Dr. Denny Ansbach, who died uh, over the weekend. He was 86. And uh, in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, he had a vision for old Sacramento, even though he was trained as a doctor and apparently his dad worked for Sandy Smoley's dad in Iowa in a doctor's office, came here to Sacramento and helped establish what we now call old Sacramento and helped create the, um, the state railroad museum and the foundation. And uh, he passed away over the weekend, but many of these things we have because of his vision. And I just, he, he, he was well loved by many, many people, but there are two things I just wanted to share about him. One was said by Cheryl Marcel, who's the president and CEO of the State Railroad Museum Foundation. And she called him a founding father of the museum and of old Sacramento. And then Ty Smith, who runs the State Railroad Museum on behalf of the state said he was a public servant, not by vocation, but by avocation. And I think those are high praise for somebody who reshaped the city and um, we lost him over the weekend. Marcus Bertone wrote a lovely column about him that was in the paper uh, yesterday. But I just thought it was important that we recognize his contributions and adjourn tonight in his memory. Very good. Um, thank you. Is there anybody else up? No one else has signed up to speak. All right. Um, members in. Uh, members of the staff and members of the public, thank you so much for uh, participating in a, in a good productive day, both this afternoon and this evening. If there's nothing else to come before the city council, we are adjourned. <laughs>